get started. Great. Um, thanks everybody for joining us for the Anthropolo Anthropology Colloquium today. I'm Heather Edgar and I'm going to be uh, hosting the talk today. Um, I'm going to ask you to please be sure to turn off your cameras during the talk um, and also to be free, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat and we can add these to the discussion at the end of the talk. Um, and so it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Katie Allsway to you. She's a biomedical anthropologist uh, who's now an assistant professor at New Mexico State University. She received her PhD at Binghamton University and her research focuses on the sociocultural, evolutionary and epidemiological dimensions on, of chronic disease risk, uh, physical and mental health outcomes associated with disasters and child health and development. Her current research projects are in uh, the Republic of Vanuatu, in Cleveland, Ohio, and even in Doña Ana County down in the southern part of our state. She's received funding from the Winter Grand Foundation for Anthropological Research, the Mountain West Clinical and Translational Research Infrastructure Network, and the Natural Hazard Center. Her research has been published in several journals, including the American Journal of Physical Anthropology and the American Journal of Human Biology. Um, and so now I'll turn the talk over to Dr. Allsway. Um, thank you very much for the welcome and I'll share my screen here. Oh. All right, can everybody, can you see that? Looks great. Okay, wonderful. All right. Okay, um, so first of all, um, thank you very much for inviting me to um, give this talk today. It's really great to try to bridge um, the programs here at New Mexico State and up there at UNM. Um, and so, uh, you know, if there's any students, just to plug our program who are interested in a, a master's degree in anthropology, um, I'd love to hear from you. And I have my email um, included at the end of this presentation. Um, so as um, Heather mentioned, um, as a biological anthropologist, I'm essentially interested in um, chronic disease and more generally, I'm interested in variation in health and why we get sick. And so I approach this sort of question from an evolutionary epidemiological and biocultural perspective. Um, a major area of my research is on obesity, and I've been interested in the question of why women tend to be more at risk for obesity than men for several years. And so today I'm going to talk about some insights into this question from my research in Vanuatu, a South Pacific island nation where I've worked since 2011. So Obesity, as, as most people know, is, is a global um, health issue. And so currently um, over 650 million people worldwide are obese and almost 2 billion are overweight or obese. At a global scale, women are about one and a half times as likely to be obese as men, although this varies considerably based on the local context. Over the past few decades, we've seen um, obesity increasingly emerging in low socioeconomic groups in high income countries like the US and in low and middle income countries. Obesity is of general concern because it's associated with multiple chronic diseases, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, some types of cancers, as well as poor mental health outcomes, disability, um, and general sort of loss of um, economic productivity, as well as social discrimination. Obesity is linked to more deaths, about um, 2.8 million per year, than major infectious diseases, including HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. And so specifically within developing countries or middle and low-income countries, um, obesity is of concern because these countries often lack the medical and public health infrastructure to deal with the sort of um, uh, chronic diseases associated with obesity. The global prevalence of obesity is greatest in the South Pacific. Um, this figure is a little older, it's from 2008, but I couldn't find a sort of comparable one um, that's more current, but the pattern still holds. So why are Pacific Islanders more at risk for obesity? Um, there's some uh, suggestion of a genetic predisposition in some populations, um, and this is perhaps based on selection for thrifty genotypes. 
due to food insecurity encountered by the ancestors of today's Pacific Islanders as they settled on these remote islands. Research though has shown that the genetic component is relatively small. Um, and so environmental conditions probably provide uh, more explanatory power for why um, Pacific Islanders are at such risk for obesity. So what we're looking at here really is the process of um, economic development, market integration, urbanization, and industrialization, which have led to an influx of processed foods um, and more sedentary lifestyles. Some places like Nauru, which you can see um, here in the center, um, which has the highest prevalence of obesity, rely almost totally on imported foods. Um, Nauru is kind of a special case because it was essentially stripped mined for phosphorus, and today the land can't support growth of traditional foods. We also see the sale of um, foods that are sort of quote unquote less desirable in Western markets like, uh, like canned mutton um, into some of these, these areas. Now, while we see um, chronic diseases like obesity and diabetes increasing in the Pacific, we also see a persistence of infectious diseases as well as undernutrition. So we're really seeing um, a multiple burden of disease. Um, you know, the epidemiological transition model sort of predicted that these countries as they undergo economic development would transition from high prevalence of infectious diseases to low prevalence of infectious diseases and then to high prevalence of degenerative diseases. Whereas we're seeing this pattern of sort of persistence of infectious disease while chronic diseases um, rapidly increase. And so all of this is part of what is termed the health transition. And so I'm going to now talk a little bit about some of the research I've been involved with on the health transition that led to um, the research question that I'm gonna to present today in Vanuatu. So, I've been part of a research team that's been studying the health transition in Vanuatu since 2007, and I joined that research team as a graduate student in 2011. Americans are not as familiar with Vanuatu um, than you know, perhaps if you were from New Zealand or Australia, um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background um, on, um, on this country. So Vanuatu's population today is nearly um, 300,000 people and um, is spread over 63 inhabited islands. The majority ethnic group are Ni Vanuatu and the population are 98% Melanesian. The islands were first settled by um, the ancestors of, of uh, Ni Vanuatu approximately 3,000 years ago. And the first European contact was in 1606. Captain Cook named the islands the New Hebrides in 1774, and the islands were under a French-English condominium government until 1980. Now today, there's a significant variability in economic development and tourism across the islands, and most people work in subsistence level horticulture. So our team has used the variability in market integration, um, urbanization across the islands to isolate factors that contribute to the emergence of obesity and chronic diseases like hypertension and diabetes. And so some of these images are from um, five islands that we've worked on. Um, I'm gonna talk about two in more particular detail in reference to my, this study that I'm talking about today. Um, but so you can sort of see some of this variation in terms of housing um, and, and local context. All right, these are data um, from our team's research in Vanuatu in 2007 and 2011. And so we're looking here at adult obesity based on body mass index. And so that's a body mass index greater than or equal to um, 30. So we can see here this model of ma uh, market integration where we have Ambai, which is a rural island with no or limited tourism, Anaichim, which is also a rural island, but we have people who frequently interact with tourists um, via cruise ships. Ifate um, is home to the urban capital of Vanuatu, uh, Port Vila, and the community where we worked on Ifate um, is classified as peri-urban. And so in terms of obesity across the islands, what you can see is an increase in obesity prevalence associated with the level of um, sort of urbanization. And so what was of particular interest to me out of this is the variation between men and women. And so you can see that the difference in obesity prevalence between men and women is largest on Afate, the peri-urban island. 
Now, the last figure showed variation in obesity based on body mass index. And so um, most of us are probably familiar with the fact that BMI is a bit of a problematic measure. Um, and in particular, I wanna note two things. First, it's not a measure of body fatness um, or body composition. It's just a measure of body size. And it also doesn't traditionally define different cutoffs for men and women. So the cutoff for men and women is 30. Um, now, this is a figure showing um, obesity prevalence based on percent body fat. And so we know that women generally have about 10 to 12% more body fat than men on average. And so the cutoff for obesity based on percent body fat accounts for this. And so the cutoff for men is 25% and the cutoff for women is 35%. Now, what's interesting to me is that even adjusting for that expected elevation of body fat in women, women still show a greater prevalence of obesity and the magnitude of the difference is greatest on a FATE. Now, I'm gonna back up for a moment. And so you can see from the title of this figure on the bottom that it's, it's from the US. Um, and so I wanna talk about the male-female dis obesity disparity a little bit more generally. So as I mentioned earlier, globally, women are about one and a half times more likely to be obese than men. But when we look at particular populations and we start breaking this down by um, national income or within countries by socioeconomic status, um, this pattern doesn't necessarily hold. Um, so in particular, what we see when we break this down by social status is, is very different. So when we look at the US um, as a whole, women show higher prevalence of obesity, which we can see um, here on the left. Now, when we look at this based on income or other aspects of social status, um, we start to see some variation. So among high income Americans, men are actually more likely to be obese than women, which we can see in the second bar. The disparity only really becomes apparent when we talk about groups that face significant social and economic inequality. And so the disparity is, is much larger when we're talking about low-income Americans and non-Hispanic Black Americans. Now, this is a pattern that's found at the national level between low and middle income countries compared to high income countries. Um, and it appears to be associated with inequality in particular gender inequality. So this says to me that there's something about um, unequal or unstable environments that promotes excess fat accumulation in women as compared to men. All right, um, so I'm gonna talk more about the sort of general anthropological view of obesity. Um, and we, we call this a biocultural phenomenon. Um, and we're gonna start with the evolutionary context. And as I do that, I just wanna sort of note here um, that today is Darwin's 212th birthday. Um, so today is Darwin Day, the International Celebration of Science. Um, so, you know, just a little shout out to, to Darwin there. All right, so in terms of our evolutionary history, um, anthropologists theorize that humans evolved in conditions of seasonal food availability which favored genotypes that promoted storing excess energy as fat for use in times of scarcity. Now, coupled with this is our large brains, which are very energetically expensive, especially when they're growing during infancy and childhood. So infants, you know, 80% of their calories per day could be going to, to brain growth and development. We also know that female fertility is closely tied to energy availability and the predisposition for excess fat in women is hypothesized to be related to the energetic demands of gestating and lactating a large brained offspring. So all of this contributes together to what we call a thrifty genotype or a genotype that again promotes fat storage. Now today we live in a very different environment than our ancestors. And so changes in the environment associated with industrialization and urbanization have increased availability of high calorie foods and um, low physical activity jobs and um, lifestyles. So in this environment, our propensity to store fat contributes to an excess of obesity. Now, many of these points have been supported by um, research, but the model is still debated. And it also doesn't explain the magnitude of excess obesity that we see in women only in specific contexts. So we would expect you know, some uh, you know, more body fatness in women based on this model, but what I'm talking about is the magnitude of the excess um, is beyond what is expected. 
And so what I've become interested in are factors associated with economic development other than diet and physical activity that may contribute to the obesity disparity between men and women. And so this traditional sort of biomedical model of obesity um, really blames it on the individual. Um, so individual energy balance is out of whack because people are doing um, risky behaviors. They're eating high calorie foods and they're not exercising. Um, this is problematic in that it um, neglects sort of the socioecological context of obesity. And so, you know, things that drive individual behaviors, limit the individual behaviors, restrict individual behaviors. Um, and it also neglects the, um, interestingly, sort of the, the individual nature of obesity in terms of different risk factors for different people. Um, so men and women have different risk factors and different outcomes. Now, when we return to this model of economic development, um, it's not just diet and physical activity that are changing. Um, there are other parts of the environment that are changing um, as well. And these factors can impact metabolism and fat storage. Um, so there's a lot of emerging research on our microbiomes um, and how those impact um, our metabolism and our propensity to accumulate body fat. Um, we also know that um, toxins and pollutants related to industrialization can act as endocrine dis disruptors, which can also impact metabolism. Um, we also know that changes in the environment can flip ep epigenetic switches, as we see in these agouti mice, um, where uh, we can um, uh, contribute there to, um, I'm sorry, there's somebody in the hallway being sort of loud. So these can contribute to different metabolic phenotypes that promote obesity. And so finally, what I'm going to talk about here um, are impacts on mental health and physiological stress in particular, and how that might contribute to obesity risk. Now, chronic psychological stress that might be associated with changing lifestyles and behaviors um, can contribute to chronic activation of the physiological stress response. And in turn, this can lead to dysregulation of metabolism and the immune and endocrine systems. And again, in turn, this can lead to abnormal patterns of fat deposition, such as on the abdomen um, and increased weight gain. Now, this is a, a pretty hot area of research right now. Um, and so we know from multiple studies that psychological distress is a powerful pathway between inequality and health disparities, including disparities in infant mortality and heart disease and emerging now obesity. So a broader question that I have related to this is what causes differences in responses to the same environment? Um, so if stress impacts obesity disparities between men and women, is it because men and women face differences in risk factors and exposures to stressors, or are they experiencing the same exposures but having different physiological responses? And so this gets into the real messiness of this question in that are we talking about gender and, and social roles, um, how people are treated differently, um, or are we talking about biological sex? Are we talking about um, biological pathways? Also knowing that biology is impacted by environmental conditions, um, especially during development. So, you know, this, this real entangled problem of gender and sex is something that needs to be um, uh, explored further. Now we're gonna bring it back to um, Vanuatu um, and sort of get specifically into my research. So in general, anthropological research on economic development and market integration has shown that these processes contribute to chronic stress. Um, in Vanuatu in particular, um, women are traditionally underrepresented in public and political spaces and um, observers have documented a high prevalence of assault and domestic abuse. My question then is whether within this backdrop, women are experiencing more stress than men due to economic development, possibly related to multiplying social roles within and outside of the home, and in turn, if these contribute to excess obesity risk. So these are the two central research questions I'm gonna um, present on um, in the rest of the presentation. So first, do women in Vanuatu show elevated indicators of chronic stress as compared to men? And two, does chronic stress play a role in the obesity disparity between men and women in Vanuatu? So a little bit on the research process and research setting. 
Um, the study took place on two islands in Vanuatu, Afate and Anaichim. And so you remember I talked a little bit about Afate and Anaichim in the beginning. Um, and so Anaichim is our, our rural island, Afate is our more urbanized island. Um, and so you can see the capital city of Port Vila located here where the star is on the map. Zoom in, um, Google Earth is great. We have a sort of more close up of um, these two villages where we primarily conducted our surveys. And so the top is Ericor on Afate. Um, and so you can see more um, sort of um, development in terms of roads. Um, at one time, the main road in town was uh, paved, um, but it hasn't been um, kept up um, quite well. Uh, the red building in the middle there is a um, church. Um, and so we sort of worked um, at a household level um, going between houses within this community. And then Analkawat on Anaichum is located um, sort of in this bay. Um, and I mentioned before that um, uh, people on Anaichum have interactions with tourists. And so this little offshore island is called Mystery Island. And you can see a landing strip there. Um, so we also have cruise ships that come in and dock here and the people on Anaichum come and sell um, goods uh, to the tourists. In this study, we recruited 367 people. Um, and you can see here that these were um, mostly women. Um, so more of the sample are women. And this is pretty usual. Um, interestingly, regardless of sort of research setting, it's, it's hard to um, recruit men into studies. Um, but in terms of the age distribution, there were no differences, uh, significant differences between these ages. And so the average age of the sample was about 41. Um, I've included some of these images here as a little bit more on context. Um, so you can see the types of processed foods that people purchase um, in stores. This is on um, in um, Efate on the left. Um, so you see a lot of canned goods, uh, rice, um, ramen, that kind of thing. Um, whereas um, people are growing in their gardens fresh foods and then taking them to markets and selling those to tourists. In the middle is essentially the um, Vanuatu version of my plate. So in the US now we use my plate instead of the food pyramid. And so you have um, sort of three food groups here. Um, so you have uh, food that are supposed to keep you healthy, food that give you energy, and then food that help you build up your body. We administered um, a survey um, and we also took um, a number of um, biophysical measurements. And so I'm gonna talk about the survey first. Um, so the survey was translated into Bislama, which is the lingua franca of Vanuatu. Um, and it included questions on demographic characteristics, characteristics of the household and family, um, individuals' medical histories, including what medications they're taking, um, diet and physical activity recalls. And then of particular importance here are the mental health surveys. So this survey, um, we derived two scores from the mental health survey, a psychological distress score and a positive mental health score. Um, and the questions come from um, uh, uh, scales that have been validated in other populations like Cohen's perceived stress scale um, that we translated um, with the help of, of local um, uh, people into, into this llama. We also took a number of, of biophysical measurements um, on the participants, um, including a number of anthropometrics. Um, so a number of um, circumferences on the limbs and the body, um, skin folds on the limbs and body, as well as um, height, weight. And we had um, a scale that measures bioelectrical impedance. And so we have um, percent body fat, percent visceral fat, and percent muscle mass. We also took um, blood pressure uh, as well as um, blood spots to measure C-reactive protein. And then again, in particular for this study, we took samples of hair to measure cortisol. Um, so cortisol um, is a, a measure of um, physiological stress. And so we can get an idea of chronic, of chronic stress by measuring cortisol in hair, because as the hair grows, cortisol gets laid down in the hair shaft. And so you can get a retrospective view of cortisol secretion over the last few months. So there aren't standard cutoffs because the sort of measurement varies between labs and between techniques, but within the population, we can get an idea of variation between you know, groups, like between men and women. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk um, about results now. And so first I'm going to talk about body composition and um, obesity. So I'm not presenting all of my measures of, of uh, body composition because it's a lengthy list. Uh, so here we have body mass index, waist circumference, and percent body fat. And so you can see, uh, based on all of these measures, um, women have, um, on average, larger body sizes, larger waist circumferences, which indicates more fat deposition around the waist, and um, a greater percent body fat. And we can also see a pattern by island where generally these measurements are higher in both women and men on a FATE, the more urbanized island, than on a NYCHEM, the more rural island. We see a similar pattern when we talk about obesity. Um, and so again, I'm using um, three different cutoffs here uh, based on a body mass index and then percent body fat and waist circumference. And both percent body fat and waist circumference are adjusted for sex. Um, so there's different cutoffs for men and women. And so again, we see this pattern of um, uh, greater obesity prevalence among women than men. Um, and um, this is regardless of the uh, uh, measurement type. What about stress? Um, so in terms of psychological stress um, or distress rather, um, I didn't find any differences um, among um, men and women. Um, and so we're talking about um, controls in the model included things like age, island of residence. Um, and uh, uh, we, we use an index of technological goods sort of as a measure of um, socioeconomic status because you can't use cash reliably because not everybody is working within a cash economy. Um, so there are controls here, but we don't see any um, difference in psychological distress between men and women. The PMH or um, positive mental health score was elevated among men as compared to women on a NYCHEM. And cortisol was significantly elevated among women on a FATE as compared to men. Now, I also wanted to note that neither indicator of psychological health was correlated with cortisol. So this indicates that whatever is elevating cortisol in women on a FATE is some other stressor than um, what we could measure based on our, um, our surveys of psychological health. Now, stress, body composition, and obesity. I found no associations between any of these measures and obesity risk. There were some sort of um, here and there um, associations between um, distress score and cortisol with some of these measurements, but nothing to really indicate a pattern. So the most notable relationships that I found were actually between positive mental health score and body composition. So positive mental health score was negatively associated with um, all measurements of skin folds in men. So these are measurements of, of body fat distribution on different parts of the body. And positive mental health was positively associated associated with limb and trunk circumferences in women. And so we see a different pattern in men and women related to this measure of mental health and body composition. All right, so in conclusion, um, as expected, um, I found that women were more likely to be obese than men um, based on multiple measures. And that we also found a general um, regional variation based on rural urban proximity found some evidence of variation in stress related to gender and place of residence, and psychological health appears to be better among women on a FATE, but physiological stress is greater. And so the sort of question is what factors are contributing to this? Um, so why would we see a better measure of psychological health, but a, a, a larger measure of physiological stress? Um, positive mental health, as I mentioned in the last slide, shows the most consistent relationship with body composition, and this pattern was different between men and women. And so this suggests to me that mental health becomes embodied differently among genders within this sample. Um, and so that's something to, to research further. Another thought that I've, I've sort of had, um, and, and part of what I'm analyzing from these data are whether men are, um, rather than something different happening to women, maybe men are doing something that's sort of forestalling weight gain and fat deposition. 
Um, and so I just wanted to note that um, tobacco use and kava use are particularly high among men in Vanuatu and, and within our sample. So kava is a traditional beverage um, and it, it comes from kava root and it has um, psychoactive properties. Um, and uh, in sort of my um, analyses, both tobacco use and kava use are associated with, um, are negatively associated with um, measurements of body fat in men and are associated with lower risk of being obese. Um, tobacco use in particular does increase with the health transition. Um, so as economic development um, proceeds, uh, you see more tobacco use, particularly among men. So, you know, maybe this is not so much women doing something differently as men doing something differently that's buffering them. I don't want to say protective because tobacco is not protective, but something that's buffering them from, from um, gaining weight. So the sort of next steps here are a longitudinal study of this population um, with a more in-depth and ethnographic understanding of the relationship between economic development, changes in gender roles, psychological distress, and chronic disease risk. I have um, several people to thank. Um, my dissertation advisor, Dr. Ralph Baruto, my collaborators, Kelsey Dancos, uh, Chim Chan, Amanda Rome, as well as a number of students. Um, another collaborator, Kathy Wander at Binghamton, um, has been um, conducting our uh, biomarker analyses, as well as all of the families um, and friends that we've made in Vanuatu um, and the Min Vanuatu Ministry of Health. Now, I went through that a little quicker than I anticipated, I think because I'm getting used to Zoom. Um, so we have, uh, it looks like plenty of time for questions. Do you want me to stop sharing? Uh, sure, that would be great. Hey, thank you so much for that talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, it was very interesting. I hope others did as well. Uh, I wanna open the floor to questions. Uh, Siobhan, it looks like you have a question. Hi, Katie. Nice to meet you. Hi there. <laughs> I'm super interested in this work. We're trying to get stuff up and running in Vanuatu, too, um, on different kinds of issues. But one thing I'm wondering about is, you know, whether cortisol is a really good measure of stress against obesity, because there's, isn't there a physiological relationship there that sort of dictates that people who are obese are going to be higher, have higher cortisol than people who are not obese. And so, so we're looking for additional kind of external measures of stress or empowerment or autonomy or within sort of gender uh, differences in the ways that they are um, stressed or not might actually give you a little bit of a better handle on whether stress per se is what uh, causes these variation in, in, in obesity and weight gain. I'm sorry, weight gain. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, there's an issue, I mean, with, with all of these sort of physiological measures of stress, right, there's a feedback between, um, you know, body fatness and, and um, cortisol body fatness and, and other measures. Um, so I, I think that, you know, this, again, a, a sort of longitudinal study, if we wanted to um, investigate these um, biomarkers in more details with individuals who are uh, don't have excess body fat um, might be um, appropriate um, because you know most of these epidemiological studies that have looked at cortisol and obesity do find um, you know there have been uh, associations there have been multiple studies in you know high income countries um, but yeah you do get in that chicken and egg problem um, so you know this is this is you know sort of a first attempt here um, you know it is a one time point and so as we move into the future sort of um, uh, assessing these these uh, more sociocultural variables in more detail um, in a more nuanced way will help to clarify that too. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about it. It's on my mind also, and something a lot of people, including myself, didn't realize until talking to Lamont Lindstrom about Vanuatu is that there's actually this kind of historical gradient going from north to south, from more sort of matrilineal origins to more patrilineal ones. And because you've got this kind of cross island design, you might be able to leverage that variation to really get um, kind of a better sense of the differences in the ways that men and women experience their own positions within those different kinds of social structures, if there's some, you know, sort of remnant legacy of that now. So I'd love to talk to you about that later, but. Well, great. Yeah, thank you.
Thanks. Do we have other people? Anybody else have a question? Feel free to put it in the chat if you uh, if that's easier for you. Or just magically appear, that's okay too. Oh good, Ozzy, you have a question? Yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. I, um, this was really interesting. I, I wondered if you had measured or have any assessment of like physical workloads that people do, including like walking and things like that. Yeah, so um, physical activity has been really hard for us to assess um, in general, because um, part of the issue is that um, people have a different sense of time um, in terms of how often they're doing things um, and how the duration of how long they're doing things. Um, so there's been some work by um, some of my colleagues who work in Vanuatu using things like um, um, accelerometers um, to, to look at that. But that's something that um, is you know, on the sort of list of, of things that we need to work out because there are differences in terms of, you know, um, are, are people thinking about physical activity in terms of the time that they're spending in their gardens, the distance that they're walking to their gardens, um, what kind of labor they're engaging in. So yeah, so that's, it's, it's, it's a, something that we haven't been able to reliably measure um, in, in these surveys relative to the other questions that we have. I had one more, if I may, and that's um, one of the challenges in research like this is really trying to pick apart um, some of the potential causal factors. Mm -hmm. Um, and so one of the problems with modernization is that many of these things often co-occur. Mm -hmm. So a changed diet, a changed activity pattern, changed stress levels, um, often changed like social roles, things mm -hmm. like this often come across. And so I guess one of the real challenges uh, there is trying to see if there's any way to tease those apart. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think that with these, these um, the, the island models are, are really useful there. Um, and so I, I think, you know, depending on the direction that this goes, um, you know, we can sort of look at the island context in, in more detail um, in terms of what particularly we wanna um, tease out. I mean, this, this started with, um, being most interested in um, sort of the traditional risk factors, diet and physical activity. And so the model is really designed for those factors. Um, but I think, you know, knowing more about the context um, um, would, you know, we could probably, um, you know, select different islands for teasing out a different question. Great, thanks for that question. Do we have others? I have one I want to ask, um, and it relates to health consequences uh, related to obesity, um, like diabetes and cardiovascular disease as the obvious choices, cancer being also one. Um, is there uh, any research yet about uh, whether those conditions are increasing in this population, whether they're increasing more in women than men, anything like that? Um, so yeah, so we've seen um, uh, increase in um, hypertension a little bit unevenly, but in general, the um, blood pressure in general is is a higher on average um, in the sort of more urbanized areas. Um, and you know, uh, we do see an increase in um, diabetes risk. I mean, it, it raises a, a question too of what these obesity cutoffs mean in this population and whether they are actually associated with greater risk in this population. Um, you know, so I, I, I think that's something that also needs to be worked out. Um, and we do see um, one of the, the major concerns with um, like diabetes is that um, people sort of treat it like a death sentence. Um, and so they don't seek um, treatment or they seek treatment for a very limited time. Um, and, um, and then there's also sort of like snake oil salesmen, people bringing in, you know, things like you can find in the markets, like these like drinks and things that are supposed to cure everything from AIDS to diabetes. And um, so I think there's, there's some research that needs to be done on um, uh, helping people to, to access treatment and then also increasing um, compliance with treatment. Um, Cause it just, you know, it, the, it's a chronic disease and it's difficult to, you know, <laughs> to keep up with this, this course especially in a setting like this. Well, that's really interesting. And I, I appreciate the, I, the thinking about what does risk mean in this particular, or, you know, because that varies a lot around the world. Yeah, I mean, there's there's differences in terms of, um, you know, average lean tissue and, and things that can all affect, you know, what the 
your body composition actually means for you. Well, thank you. Do we have uh, any last questions from our community? Any students out there have questions they'd like to ask? Hi, I have a question. Um, what's the prevalence of, of obesity in the children in that population? Um, it's really low. Um, so, oh, okay. so, yeah, so with these, these health transitions, what you generally see is that obesity emerges first in women and then men and then children. And so we, we really are not seeing it in children yet um, based, on, based on what the data we've collected. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that question. Anyone else? It's your chance. And you can, you know, please email me if you have any questions. And again, I'm really happy to hear from students um, as well. Well, I want to thank you for your time and for your presentation. It was very interesting. And um, uh, I think our audience really appreciated it too. So thank you very much for that. Um, we will post this uh, um, at some point. I'm not sure exactly what will happen, but it'll become available online. So if you know other people who would be interested in seeing this but weren't available to come now, um, please tell them that it'll be available through the UNM Anthropology website. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I hope that our departments can do more together in the future. I hope so too. <laughs> Have a fantastic day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. And happy Darwin Day. Happy Darwin Day. <laughs>